introduce each of our panelists. Um, I'm going to kind of read through their biographies. Uh, Vicki Santana. <laughs> Vicki is a 1993 graduate of Whittier College. She majored in sociology and was involved in the Hispanic Student Association. She currently serves as the director of the Los Angeles County Probation Department and is the vice president of the Board of Trustees for Rio Hondo uh, College. Uh, Trustee Santana's past work includes acting as manager for the Los Angeles County Probation Department, as well as senior justice deputy and education deputy for Los Angeles County Supervisor Gloria Molina. She is a graduate of Bell Gardens High School and also attended Columbia University and the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. So welcome. Next is Commander Darcy Cunningham. You can't tell. <laughs> Commander Cunningham is a 1993 graduate of Whittier College as well. She majored in business administration and, is, and participated in the Thalian Society and softball. She received her master's of business administration from St. Mary's <coughs> College. Currently, she serves as the commanding officer at the U.S. Coast Guard Base, uh, Los Angeles, Long Beach. She has been um, a mission support professional her entire life. Um, her, after receiving her mission from Officer Candidate School, she served as field units, she served at field units including Integrated Support Command, Alameda, and Sector Northern New England. At depot level, she served two tours at Maintenance and Logistics Command Pacific, and at headquarters level, she served as the in the Financial Analysis Division of the Office of Budget and Program, and most recently as the Executive Assistant to the Coast Guard's Chief of Staff, Deputy, Deputy Commandant for Mission Support. So welcome. Mike. Hoppen, oh. Hoppen um, is a 1994 graduate of Whittier College, where he majored in political science. Since that time, he has been the deputy director and deputy district director of the Los Angeles Office of the Governor of California. He, uh, also, the special assistant to the California Department of Insurance for Insurance Commission, and the deputy director of special projects for the Office of Lieutenant Governor. Currently, he works as a consultant for the Speaker's Office of Number Services. And finally, last but certainly not least, Armilla Staley Ngomo. Yep. Um, <laughs> is, uh, she's a 2003 graduate of Whittier, and she majored in political science and Spanish. She was very actively involved on campus, uh, participating in um, the Athenian Society, Model United Nations, Council of Representatives, and the Black Student Union, among others. She earned her law degree from Bull Hall School of Law um, at the University of California in Berkeley. During her time there, she participated in clinical programs such as the California Asylum Representation Clinic, the Juvenile Hall Outreach Program, and the Death Penalty Clinic, among others. Um, since then, she's gained experience as a litigation attorney for Morrison and Forrester, um, LLP in San Francisco, and as a law clerk with the Honorable Consuela Bland Marshall, U.S. District Court Judge for the Central District of California in Los Angeles. She also served as Deputy B. Deputy Public Defender for the Office of the Federal um, Public Defender. Currently, she is an attorney with Coldwell, Leslie, and Proctor, where she specializes in civil litigation and white collar criminal defense. So let's take a second and welcome our panelists. And they're all from New College. <laughs> okay, so um, the way this is going to work is they're going to each take about 10 minutes to talk a little bit about their experience, how they've come through the process of graduating from Whittier and becoming young professionals and moving on to where they are now. And then after they each speak for 10 minutes, we'll open it up to questions from you guys. Great. Okay. Um, do we want to start down here? Sure, sure. I, uh, this might be an encouraging story for you folks. Um, I, uh, I was a business major at Whittier, uh, specifically at accounting. And uh, I knew I wanted to be an accountant when I got to Whittier. So I even did an internship with General Motors here in Whittier. Pull on yards, and then I pursued a job in accounting following graduation. Well, I got an accounting job following graduation and realized it was the last thing I ever wanted to do. <laughs> so I was a little nervous, you know, I had gotten a business degree, and so I was, like, I was a little misguided for a couple of months. But uh, what, I, what I was looking at after I graduated and realized accounting wasn't my forte, I was like, I need something completely opposite of what I got my degree in. Um, and what I did is I looked at uh, the Peace Corps. <coughs> And I like the Peace Corps because it would pay for my uh, financial aid. I know it's a bad motive to join the Peace Corps, but uh, Peace Corps was one option. And then I looked at uh, the Marine Corps and then the Coast Guard. And I said, whatever picks me first to get me out of this rut, I'll be happy to do. And uh, the, the Peace Corps picked me first. 
but there was a 10 month wait for language school because they were going to send me to Russia to help small businesses get developed. And I'm like, I need a job. I can't wait 10 months. So Coast Guard and Marine Corps both called me up and said, we're interested, but you have to go through this elaborate interview process, application, board, panel, the whole yard. So I went through both processes for both services and uh, the Coast Guard was much more appealing to me than the Marine Corps and I got selected and I can say now it was probably the best thing I ever did. Um, been in 18 and a half years now. They paid for my graduate degree. Uh, I've been all over the world through the Coast Guard. I've done some fantastic things, seen fantastic things. And I've had experiences I, I can't even begin to describe. And the ironic part about it is the Coast Guard selected me because I had a business degree. So I actually have done a lot of business related stuff, but it's been fun. It hasn't been just number crunching. It's been, you know, interacting, budget development. So it's been, you know, really what I wanted to do when I was in Whittier. So in the end, it worked out really well for me. Um, and again, it's probably the best thing I could have ever done. I, I'm, I'm just thrilled and I hope to keep going as long as they'll let me go. So um, talking in terms of maybe leadership for just a minute, uh, I've learned three things that are really important to me. Um, the first thing is lead by example. Um, you want to make sure that, like, if you have a staff or if you supervise an office, a unit, an organization, you want to make sure that, you know, if you're holding people accountable for policies, rules, practices, that you do the same for yourself. And it can be something as little as, you know, if your folks need to be in at work by 7.30 every day, you need to be too. If you expect people to have reports done by a certain time or abide by, you know, just certain work practices, you need to do the same. They're not going to respect you if you don't go by the same rules you're trying to enforce. And you will get that respect if you do the same. Um, the second thing is consistency. And you'll probably learn this more as you gain experience. But the Coast Guard in particular, we have a lot of rules and regulations in place. And the best way to be consistent is to follow those rules and policies. And I can go back to the example of being late for work, for example. If you've got somebody that you work with, or, work, or works for you, rather, and you kind of let them slide, they come to work late, they come to work late, you know, that shows favoritism, and you're, you're going against what policy states. So that's really not a good thing to begin with. And people are gonna watch that. When you're, when you're a leader, you're like in this bubble, and you're always being watched. Every move you make, they're gonna watch. So you start making exceptions to one person, you may start doing it for another, and then for another, and then for another. Now, while adhering to policy and enforcing policy is never a fun thing for a boss to do, if you start not doing that, you're going to lose structure within your organization. And from there, you're going to lose work ethic, you're going to lose work productivity, frankly. So consistency in how you treat people and how you use things. And, and again, it goes back to using policy, just sticking to the rules. And that means you will be fair, you will be consistent, may not make you the favorite person in the office, but at least you can say, I'm doing the same thing for you that I'm doing for everybody else. So I think that's very important. And the last thing I'll mention is everybody looks through their own lens. And what I mean by lens is every single person in this room has different experiences. They have different backgrounds and how they were raised. They have different cultures. Just a variety of different things that makes them that individual. So you have to respect the fact that everybody in this room has a different way of seeing things. They have a different way of organizing their thoughts, on perceiving things, on coming to conclusions. So, so when you're working in an office with a team, in a large group, think about that. Think about the fact that everybody is seeing something slightly different and respect that because that's just the way we're made up. We, we tack things very differently than the next person. So appreciate that. And frankly, if you appreciate that, you will recognize that if you capitalize on that, you will bring all these different strengths, different perspectives, different experiences together, and you will come up with some great solutions because you may see things one way, another person sees something different, and they may find or see something that you didn't see. So you could come up with all these great solutions. So just be respective of the different lenses that everybody has. And that's carried me through for most of my career, excuse me. Um, I'm still learning. I mean, 18 and a half years, you, you never stop learning. And I, I look for opportunities like this to talk to students or junior folks in my command. And it's amazing the things that I hear or the things that I learn every day. So kind of keep that in mind as well. So that's it. Great, thank you. Why don't we move? One thing that wasn't mentioned in my bio is that um, I, did, I did go to Columbia University. I was there for a year and a half. And then I got pregnant. I chose their year and then I got pregnant. And then I went back to 
Columbia when, when I was pregnant with my son. Uh, <clears throat> and so I had him in January, and two weeks later I started here at Whittier College. So I was a transfer student. Um, and so my, my experience here at Whittier was very different and unique because I had a newborn. Um, and so when everybody was sitting for final for midterms, I was I had a teething baby that had a cold. Um, I was a commuting student for the for the first year, and then I moved um, to friends. So I was walking distance from campus, so that that made a huge difference. And for me personally, because of my personal circumstances, Whittier was the perfect place. You know, my professors were on a first name basis. I could take my son to class with me. Um, and I did, and you know it was because <laughs> you know no babysitter I had to go to class, right? Um, and so, and you know they were very, they were wonderful, and so this was the perfect place for me. Um, while I was here, I, I I did work steady, but then my between the summer between my junior and senior year, I decided uh, I w started working for a law firm down on um, Greenleaf and and Bar Vista. Um, that attorney did workers comp law, so I worked there for a year, and then I graduated. And so the economy wasn't so good, right, back then? <laughs> so just like now, not as bad, but it still wasn't very good in 1993. So um, he actually hired me on. And I went from making $5 an hour to making $10 an hour overnight, which was not much, but it was a big difference for a single mom. Um, and so I lived here, I stayed here in Whittier for a while. Um, what I ended up doing was I made that a career. So I learned workers' comp law. I kind of became a specialist in that. and. When uh, an opportunity presented itself, I started doing vocational rehab counseling, which was helping injured workers um, get back to work in a new capacity. So I did counseling, and that was more tied to the sociology work that, that, that I had done here at Whittier. Um, I wanted to be a lawyer originally, but then I took Dr. No's class and I said, no. <laughs> 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 I <can't. laughs> I Judicial procedures, I don't know what, but I said, no, 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 no. So, um, so that changed. So. I started doing counseling and that was more of a fit. I was helping people. You know, I, I had been raised that you should, I should be a public servant, I should be helping. And so I was helping people get back to work. Um, and then I started my own business. I had two business partners. So in 2000, uh, we started our own business. And that really uh, helped it, well, helped me financially. I was able to buy my first house. My, my son but at the time was now nine years old. Um, but then there were changes in the workers' comp law in 2002. And um, I think somebody's boss had a little something to do with it. But no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so there were changes in the law, and I saw it coming. You know, I was lobbying in Sacramento, trying to get more benefits to injured workers. Um, but there was going to be a payoff, because in government, that's what happens. Yes, you're going to give more of a benefit, but something has to get cut, because they're not going to give you, the, the pie is still the same. So they basically cut out the counselor in the process. And so I saw that coming and I said, you know what, I don't want to be out of a job of making good money. I had a mortgage, I had a son. Um, and so I rehabbed myself and I put myself through graduate school. Um, and I decided to go full time. Um, so my son and I decided to move across the country and we went to Harvard. And it was kind of a very, you know, interesting decision because um, it was sort of like completion for me. You know, I had started on the East Coast and then had to kind of interrupt that trajectory because I have my son, but now he's there with me, so it's just a, such a wonderful experience to have with him, and I think he, his life changed completely as a result. Um, he now is a senior in college himself, so some of Whittier. you yeah, no, no. Oh. <laughs> no, he says we live, and I live in Whittier now, so he said, Mom, I don't want to run into you in Uptown, so I'm not going to go. <laughs> I'm not going to Whittier, which is fine with me. So he went to, John, he's at Johns Hopkins University, and he, right now he's doing a fellowship in Washington, D.C., do um, taking graduate level classes in him and May he graduated, so I'm very proud of that. Um, so that baby that changed my life is not a baby. But um, so anyway, so then I went to graduate school, came back, and I had the summer between my my first year and my second year in in my program, I worked for Supervisor Molina, um, and I did. My brother was working for her as well, so I kind of had to be out of his you know chain of command. So I started. I was doing. Nothing really. I mean, some field, some special project that she had, which was fine, but it wasn't really real policy work. That I, that's what I had gone to school for, is to get my master's degree in public policy. But then when I graduated, my brother and I, so my family, we do everything together. He also, he's a '91 Whittier College alum. We also have another brother who's a 2009, no eight, uh, Whittier College alum. But so this brother, uh, who is now the CAO of the City of Los Angeles, um, he. We decided to swap, so he went to Harvard, and I started working for the supervisor. And um, 
And so I started, that's how I started my new career in public policy. So I worked for her for seven years. I did, I, I was blessed to be able to do amazing policy work for the community I was raised in. Um, you know, I, my specialty was law enforcement. So the sheriff's department, the probation department, um, the DA, the courts, everything dealing with the criminal justice system were it, policy issues that I dealt with. Um, and more specifically, in communities that are unincorporated, so they're not a city like East Los Angeles, Belinda, uh, Florence Firestone, the supervisor was their only uh, their only um, elected official. There was no city mayor, there's no city council. It's basically the board of supervisors. And so for those communities, I was able to advocate for increased patrol, increased police services, and we saw crime go down significantly. You know, of course now we're cutting. That's another story. And so, and then, so I got some crazy idea to run for elected office, and I did. So uh, last year at this time, I would not have been able to join you because I would have been debating, like, the president <laughs> at a much smaller level at, um, you know, uh, to represent my community at Real Hondo. That's an elected uh, position. Um, I'm a trustee. So it's very, it's very, it's, it's tiny because we, we represent the Rio Hondo Community College District, but it covers five cities. Pico, I represent Pico Rivera, the city, part of the city of Whittier, and Monte, South and Monte, um, Santa Fe Springs, unincorporated Whittier. So it's, we represent a lot of people. We make a lot of decisions that impact high school kids and people trying to go back to college and um, what courses are available. So last November I got elected. I was sworn in in December, and so I've been there since. Um, so now I have, so I left the supervisor's office because it's politics on both sides that have driven me crazy and now I work for the probation department and I'm, I'm actually a, man, a director of a program, a manager. Going back to my roots as workers' comp, now my job is to, to work for the employer, not, no longer necessarily advocating for the employee, the injured worker. I work for probation and I try to get people back to work because they've been injured on the job, they have a non-industrial medical condition. And some of our employees have been out for 10, 15 years. So, you know, the challenges I saw as a counselor were nothing in comparison to what I'm seeing now. Um, as government, you know, all of the money that they receive, as yes, government employees, all the money they receive comes out of the taxpayer dollars. So they're, they're out for some of these employees for 10 years. It's 10 years that the, that the taxpayer has paid for them to be on disability. And some are very injured and some of them are just scared to come back to work. And some of them don't want to, whatever the reason is, I help bring them back help accommodate them, help them, making sure we don't violate disability laws. So that's been very challenging and it's taking me a lot of work hours and thankfully I don't have a young child anymore because having two jobs that take up that much time would be extremely challenging. But um, but I have, but I must say it's been very rewarding on both ends, you know, to see people come back to work after so many years of being out, trying to change the culture of the department. And also at the same time have the opportunity, especially in these difficult times where we're cutting in education, to really look at it through the lens of the student and making sure that we make it access, we, we don't make the cuts, we don't make cuts that impact students. And the experience that I had at Whittier, you know, has been absolutely um, critical in helping me make those decisions. I really do feel that the public system you know, needs to kind of mirror what we do in the private, in the private colleges. You know, we're, you know, I was very fortunate. I had a child and I still graduated in four years. In people, students who want to go to public schools because they can't afford it or they can't get into a private school, they don't have that same option because even if they have the will, there's so many other challenges that keep them from being able to take the classes that they want and being able to transfer on time or being able to graduate on time. So, you know, so I'm, I'm I feel very fortunate to be able to advocate at that level, and I use us as here at Whittier as a standard. My name is Armella, and I graduated in 2003, so I'll be coming up on my 10-year reunion next year. Um, I like to get <laughs> sorry to call that out. <laughs> um, I like to tell a little bit about my background when I go into why I chose a career I did because I think a lot of people can usually relate to some extent. Um, my family is originally from Equatorial Guinea. It's in West Africa. It's a former Spanish colony, so we were actually raised in Spain, speak Spanish. 
Um, my father was in the military, he was in the Air Force, and he met my mom in Europe, and then that's where they had they got married, had us, and we were raised there. My mom is a seamstress, my dad is in the Air Force, and I'm the first person in my family to go to college. When we moved to Las Vegas, my parents um, divorced, and I was raised single, immigrant mom, English as a second language, seamstress, so it was very difficult financially growing up. And the decisions that I had to make and take into consideration in deciding which college to attend largely relied on financial aid. And Whittier College stepped up in that department. It was a wonderful school with a wonderful education that was still near Las Vegas so I could still help my family, my mom and my brother who lived there at the time. And I, I value this education almost as, as, as more than I do my UC Berkeley education just because it set the foundation for me to be able to succeed later on. Um, I've always wanted to be a public servant, having family in the military, having family who were involved in civil rights work in Africa and in Madrid, trying to have my mom's country be independent from Spain. It was always an interest of mine. So even here, um, during at Whittier, I was always involved in political science, kind of the Council of Representatives, also very involved in like the Hispanic um, Student Associ Honor Society, the different um, law associations to try to understand if that was something I wanted to do because again, with my family didn't have money, I couldn't really grasp the concept of how I would pay for the LSAT law school applications, um, what I needed to do, could I go straight through law school, did I maybe need to take some time off so I could save money to afford those things, take an LSAT prep course, things of that nature. So I did decide to take two years off in between undergrad and law school, especially because I knew I wanted to be a public interest lawyer, I wanted to pursue criminal defense and civil rights. Um, I took two years off, worked in public policy, that's where I first became a public servant, was doing the uh, Capital Senate Fellows Program, which is out of Cal State Sacramento, and I was a Judicial Administration Fellow. So I was able to work at the Superior Court level and do Homeless Caring Court, um, Criminal Expungement Calendar, expunging uh, criminal records for people who had a, a criminal history but as juveniles and wanted to be able to move on with their lives and be able to apply to jobs and vote and do things of that nature that they wouldn't be able to do if their criminal record wasn't expunged. Homeless Caring Court, we don't think of the infractions that homeless people get. Um, having an open bottle, urinating in public, sleeping in public, things like that, disturbing the peace, crimes like that where they get misdemeanors and infractions. They can't leave their property or their belongings to go to court to address these issues and so then they have warrants stacking up, bench warrants stacking up, fines stacking up. So we tried to bring the court to them and have courts held in um, different homeless shelters so that they could clear those infractions so they could move on with their life. Um, I was always interested in family law, interested in juvenile justice issues, so I got involved in that as a fellow and I was able to do that for two years. And that helped bolster my resume for the time that I ended up applying to law school. Um, during the law schools where I think I started more in my criminal defense background, I did death penalty work, that's really what I enjoy. I represent people who are on death row. We try to get you know, mitigation, try to help their case if they didn't have ad adequate representation at the stage of the trial stage, we try to help them with that. It's not necessarily to get them released, but it is to fight the death penalty overall and to try to get them life without parole so that they can stay perhaps incarcerated for life, but at least they're not sentenced to death. And so that's how I initially started my work in law school was representing people in that capacity. Um, I also would teach students in juvenile halls, so students who are either awaiting maybe having a more serious sentence or who are just serving time in juvenile hall for getting in trouble in school or doing something like that. We would teach them street law, we would teach them their rights so that they knew in their communities of police officers, of teachers, or if anybody was harassing them, giving them a hard time, pulling them over, arresting them, they kind of knew their rights. They knew they had the right to remain silent. They knew they could ask for an attorney. They knew all the rights that applied to them even though they weren't 18 years old yet so that they wouldn't be in juvenile hall in deeper trouble than they would have been had they not known these rights. Um, so those are the type of things that I did in law school that kind of reinforced the fact that I wanted to do criminal defense. So I feel like I'm basically here to encourage everyone to take a road less traveled because it's not popular. Um, when you're in court, you're representing you know, the underdog, you have the prosecutors who are against you, the judges who are against you, the probation department who a lot of times at the federal, in the federal system who are against you, and you really are the voice for people of color, um, people who don't have money, people with mental health issues, people with you know, physical health issues, and you're really there to help them, and they need the strongest, adequate, reputation that they can get. It's not just the prosecution that needs to have that. Of course, you know, we need to have a strong police force, a strong law enforcement, a strong prosecution force, but it's really important to understand that criminal defense needs to be just as strong. Not just for the innocent, but also for the guilty so that they have representation and they're getting the best deals that they can. And their issues are addressed and why they committed the crimes that they did or why they're on drugs and how they can get off drugs or how they can support their family if they do have to serve time, things like that. Those are the things that a defense attorney can help their client with. Um, it's an extremely rewarding job. It's extremely satisfying. Um, I did that for during law school and then two years after law school. 
Um, I worked at a big law firm and similar to um, you know, pursuing a, something that you think is financially rewarding and that will be interesting, you find that it's really not necessarily what you want to do and it's okay to change your mind halfway through. Um, I thought maybe I'd be able to stick it out for three or four years, pay down some loans and then go into public service, but I was there five months and already needed to find my way out. I was ready to pursue my career in criminal defense and when I did make that change, it was the most rewarding thing I could have ever done for my life. Um, the clients are often, especially in Los Angeles County, Spanish speaking, as I said, people of color, Latinos and African Americans, and so you're really representing a, a community that does not often have people on their side. Um, and for that reason, it's very rewarding, especially if you speak a second language, if you come from an immigrant background, or if you sympathize with their issues at all. I mean, it's very helpful if you can relate to your clients as well. Um, now, I do. I joined a law firm of former federal public defenders who do white-collar criminal defense. So it's similar work, but it's more like bank fraud, securities fraud, kind of representing employees of big corporations, in addition to continuing to take on panel assignments. So. When the court can't, when the federal public defender can't take cases because there's a conflict, let's say there's a case where five people got arrested, the federal public defender can take the first person, but the other four people, there's conflicts. The office can't represent all five people in the same case. We'll get those cases. Um, and then white collar criminal defense is more of your intellectual crimes, if you want to call it, like securities and bank fraud and Medicare fraud and things of that nature. So I find it equally rewarding. I wish I could dedicate my time full time to representing the indigent. But for financial reasons, I decided to take on a different route, but with an office that was still made up of people who were former federal public defenders, and it's and it's amazing. Um, so if you have any questions about what it's like pursuing, you know, any type of work, kind of representing the indigent, representing people of color, um, and how rewarding it can be, and what steps you can take during college and after college to pursue that, you know, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Um, I first came to Weir College, I was a transfer student at Cal State Fullerton. It was the early 90s, and at the time, public or public education, as it is today, it was starting to become very unaffordable, or unmanageable, I would say, I didn't say that. Um, waiting for class, waiting, you know, kind of like standing in line for an iPhone. You, you wait, wait in line, wait in line, wait in line, you don't get it, and that's what classes were like in Fullerton. And that kind of started me thinking about, like, why are we having these problems? We're, one of the biggest states in the country, I don't understand. But at that time, a friend, a family friend suggested you should really start thinking about going to a smaller school, smaller liberal arts school. And I did research, and the funny story is, I started at the bottom and went up looking at schools. So I started down below Whittier College, called Whittier. I, I came, did a campus visit, loved the campus, loved the atmosphere. So I decided to put all my energy in coming in here, and I got accepted, and I was here for two and a half years and just loved it. And um, part of the thing that, that I think helped me in the career I am now is just the level of how your professors treat you. They treat you as equals, well, maybe not all of them, but most of them treat you as equals. <laughs> and in my, in my career, I'm working with people with tremendous egos, <laughs> uh, to say the least. But I still approach them as an equal. I mean, I just don't, I don't let them talk down to me. I, I think they're doing something wrong, I will tell them, you're doing something wrong. And most of the time, they won't like to hear that, but they know I'm right. Because they sometimes need to get out of that little bubble they're in and listen to what I'm actually saying, because I'm actually trying to help them. But go back to the past. So when I'm back at Weir College, and I don't know, do they still have the, are any political science majors here? Do they still have the politics outside the classroom, the J term? I don't think so, because the, the professor who taught it, he retired a few years after I left. But we had this course, it was called Politics Outside the Classroom. So part of the course is that we would go and visit super, like a supervisor's office, we went to visit a lobbyist, uh, and then the final week we went up to Sacramento and we did a tour of the Capitol. We actually went and visited different legislators and also other constitutional officers. So we went and we visited, uh, at that time, who's now Congresswoman Napolitano, her office, she was used to represent this area, and we started talking, and we had mentioned to her that um, that my friend and I, we, we started the Democratic Club for Whittier College, which was a big thing because this is Richard Nixon's alma mater, and it was the Richard <laughs> Nixon Young Republican Club, and they were, she was very impressed that we were able to organize students here. This is back in 92 during um, the Clinton presidential, first Clinton presidential race. So she was very excited to know that there were young Democrats at Whittier College. So we get back to campus and she calls us up. And we're like, whoa, 
pretty cool. And Assemblywoman's calling stuff saying, hey, I really need help working. I need some young people working on my campaign. I'm running for re-election. Can you, you know, volunteer some time? So a friend of mine, a friend of mine we decided to volunteer. I was already graduated at the time. I graduated mid, mid-year. So I was had some time to spare because I was thinking about going to law school, but I didn't quite want to commit fully. I was still finding myself. So we go and we work on her campaign for a few months, and then um, she was actually being to, being helped out by then Speaker Willie Brown, and we were dealing with Speaker Brown's um, campaign, not campaign staff, but their their uh, assembly consultants. So I was talking to one, and we were talking about how all the stuff we did here at Weir College, and where I live, where I was living now, and he was like, "Wow." We really need somebody like you at this one campaign. It's in your home district. Do you want? Do you want to like work here? And I'm like, yeah, I got student loans to pay like everybody else. Of course, I'll take a job. I didn't even ask how much it was. I said, yeah. So I I worked on this campaign for through, through the summer into into the election season, and fortunately uh, we lost. It was 1994, and it was a bad year for Democrats. Uh, but. Working at that campaign, I learned the most important thing is networking, and I think it's something all you guys should learn to do. Uh, met people who were involved in the, the speakers' organization. They were, you know, they're all most of them are based in Sacramento, but they remember you, and you know, you keep in, keep in touch with them. Now it's so much easier than it was back then. Trust me. So um, that finished that job, and then they're, they're like, they called me like. Two weeks later, they go, you haven't got a job yet. I go, no. Well, we have this other job we need you to do. We want you to help out. There's this recall going out in West Covina. So I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. You know, whatever. Did that. Fast forward. We lost that one, too. <laughs> this, is, this is the bad part of my, my career. Because then after I did that campaign, of course, they were like, hey, we have another campaign for you. Want to go, yeah, I want it. Worked on another uh, primary race. Lost that one. So I was like going, man, three straight losses, I must be a real loser here. So I, I did something really stupid, I went into the private sector, no offense everybody, but I went to go work for a, a PR firm, which it kind of had, had some, some skills in public relations because I'm working on campaigns, I'm trying to get my candidate elected, it's getting his, public, public, his, uh, his ID up so people would like this guy. So I went to work there for about a year and absolutely hated it. It's just, it wasn't for me. So I, I left and then I, um, I went to go work for, uh, for, at that time, Lieutenant Governor Ray Davis, who was running for governor, and just went in full force. This, is, this was the first time that in 16 years that a Democrat actually had a shot at winning the governor's race in 1998. And uh, I, I did several things on that campaign. The one thing I, I was very good at was being very, I could multi, mul had multiple, do multiple tasks, do multiple things on a campaign. Uh, I started working on what's called the advanced team, where we would set up events for. You know, I'm sure all of you watch the campaigns. You see these big political rallies and how they get. You say, "Wow, wow, look how great these rallies look." So I, my job was getting those rallies set up, and trust me, a lot harder than they really look they, than they look. And I also had a second job on the campaign was I'm tracking all his contributions, which also was kind of fun when. You look at a check and you're like, well, hey, here's a check from Tom Cruise. So that was kind of fun, but that part wasn't really for me. It was more of the fun spending than the fun raising part of the campaign. <laughs> so we get Governor Davis elected, and one of the benefits of being or working for, for a governor or, or someone who is the chief executive of the state is that he has plenty of jobs he needs to fill. Because essentially, as we study the spoil system, when a new guy, when a new executive come in, comes in, he's going to fill up those roles with people he trusts. So I was given a, an, some options on what I can do in the administration. Um, most of them dealt with me moving up to Sacramento, which I really wasn't too pleased at because it just Sacramento wasn't for me. But uh, you know, it, it kind of hurt me in a way because that's where everything was being was being was happening was in Sacramento. But I also knew that Governor Davis was to someone from Southern California, and he would spend a lot of time in Southern California. So I decided to work in his, uh, his regional office here in Los Angeles. So I was eventually just one another uh, staff person there, but then eventually I, as people come and go, I was elevated up to deputy director of his office. And I was mainly charged with also doing a lot of his, his um, event coordination, 
with him, for him and his uh, his wife because she the the spouse usually has a very active schedule as well to promote our policies. And it kind of also stumbled me into more of the communications role that that I, I do now today is setting is in setting up a, a communication plan on how to get best get their message across. And let me tell you, when things are great, as we, we're not seeing now, it doesn't matter what you say, people love you. But when things go bad, it doesn't matter what you do, they just hate you for it. <laughs> so as we can see now with, with President Obama, I mean, you know, he came in at a bad time, so no matter what he does, sometimes people are gonna hate you for it. But um, what, one of the things I, I, that worked for me was that since I was always good at, at planning and executing plans and organizing, it came easy for me to do advance and, and uh, special projects. So I uh, worked for Governor Davis for, for six years, and of course we all know that history. He initially gets recalled. And then I went to go work for Department of Insurance, working in their communi community relations uh, department, where uh, I was in charge of running a program called Low Cost Auto, which uh, really was a Really, you, when you start looking at what insurance is, it's funny because we were there talking about insurance at the day, and I just chuckled because I'm going, God, if half these people knew how insurance companies really work, you would shake your head. Um, so we ran this program called Low Cost Auto, where we we insured, we tried to get people of low income auto insurance for I think at the time was three hundred dollars. No, it was like under three hundred dollars, which is amazing, but you had to meet certain economic criteria. And we were, at the time, we were trying to take this program statewide, because at the, at the time it was only available in LA and San Francisco. And just the battle that some insurance companies uh, were giving us, saying, no, you can't do this because, you know, all these welfare moms who drive Mercedes are going to end up u abusing this program. We're like, I mean, listen, they're not going to do it for one. We'll put, they have to prove their economic, uh, where they are economically, and we'll put provisions with you saying that the, the value of the car can't exceed a certain amount. So eventually, you know, we battled, we battled with the insurance companies, and they, they finally agreed, kind of agreed, to, uh, to extend this program in. It, it was just an eye-opener how, how some, some, some industry, they would just do everything they can not to, to be helpful to people. And this was one of those programs that was a win-win for everybody because it made sure that people were safer drivers because now they had insurance, so it, it, it helped the people, uh, just everybody. Because now it it made the road the road safer because we had everyone you knew had. Because now everyone has to have insurance, and we know that's not true. So I I was so I was working for the insurance commissioner, and he eventually ran for lieutenant governor, and I moved along with him to the lieutenant governor's office, where I worked again as a director of special projects. But as one of my projects was that he wanted to do a campus tour because the lieutenant governor sits on the board of trustees at uh, the, UC, the UC and the CSU board of trustees. And I took a major crash course on higher education policy. I'm not much of a policy person, but wow, that was just an eye opener because um, this was the time where every year we were at these trustee meetings and they were raising rates left and or student tuition left and right cutting teachers, cutting classrooms, even uh, trying to negotiate down um, the faculty union's wages, which really gets kind of tenuous because you kind of sympathize for our teachers, but it's just, it's funny because the only way they can get their, their salary they want is to raise tuition, but they don't want tuition, so it's really a catch-22. But, it, but uh, we did a tour of of uh, 15 of the 23 UC campuses, and I just found going to UC these campuses uh, interesting because it's just, it's not Whittier College. I mean, you know, you go and you talk to a professor, and they're like, you know, they're not a person. It seems to me where you come here and it's, you know, I want to talk to you know, Fred or Berkey, as we used to call him. It's like he call you and say, hey, come on over to my house, have dinner with me, and you know have dinner and we'll talk over about our, my assignment. So. It, it's, it's just a different world, I guess, looking at how the UCs and the CSUs are, but it's it's a challenge now, just based on everything that's going on with them and how their how higher education is, is being affected today because of the economy we're in. Um, so that leads me to the present. Uh, after the Lieutenant Governor decided he was going to run for Congress, I decided I'm not a federal 
government person, I'm a state government person, so I decided to move on to the to the speaker of the assembly, where that's where I am now. I it's kind of like full circle because the people who first got me involved in state government is when I'm one of those people now. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, a, what's called a, 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 spe a member consultant, where I help consult, I help um, members in, here in Los Angeles with running their their district offices, uh, putting on the events for them, making sure that they are on message with what the caucus is doing, uh, making sure that uh, when they go and speak to communities, to community forums and community events, that they look very professional, that they, not them personally, but that the events are done in a very professional manner so that people keep a high regard of what their elected officials are and make sure that they are actually speaking to the people they need to speak to. Because in the end, it is the people in their district that make sure that they have a job and that make sure that that they can go up to Sacramento and help them and help their communities. Um, and it goes back to what I said, is that when you hear at your College and you're speaking to a professor, you feel like you're speaking to them as equals, not as subordinates. So that helps me when I deal with them because I, I tell them, like I said, I think you're doing this wrong, you should be doing it this way, or you shouldn't be doing this, or you should be following closer to the talking points to what the caucus is doing. And uh, after doing this for two years, a lot of them, they don't argue with me, I don't say they don't argue with me, but they, they take my opinion and they go, okay, got it. So, but um, just the end, um, you know, one of the things that when you, uh, when you do go into the workforce is um, always speak out, speak your mind. Uh, sometimes what you say might, may not be popular, but sometimes it's what people need to hear and especially if you're in a subordinate role and you need to tell your supervisor or tell someone at a higher level if they're doing something wrong you need to tell them you're doing something wrong you just have to speak your mind that's always been the, in a respectful manner <laughs> but that's uh, just the parting words i want to give thank you so much responsibility is providing the care and feeding for 2,200 people. Mm -hmm. So if I don't speak up, or if I don't see things going in the right direction, if I don't speak up, the people above me who manage the money, who manage the resources, won't give us what we need to care and feed for those 2,200 people. So that's really my, my primary focus is outreach. You know, I have, I have an executive officer who works, he's kind of like my, my vice president of sorts. He manages all the daily, day-to-day -day activities, making sure things are running smoothly. And I, so he's looking internally. I'm looking externally. So I have to make sure that I'm listening to what my XO is telling me. Man, we need this, that, or the other thing. And then I turn around, look for the right people, and say, hey, my crew is not happy because of this. They need these resources. They need to be given some breaks. They're getting overworked. You know, all those different things. So that's that's my focus. And uh, if I don't speak up. You know, and like like you were saying, you know, I don't care if it's negative, positive, or whatever. I have to speak on behalf of my folks. So it's challenging because you don't always get you what you want, and it always doesn't come across very well. And you know, a lot of times, at the party line, particularly in this fiscal climate, sorry, we don't have these resources. We don't have this money. We can't give you guys relief. You, you still kind of keep doing the missions, Roger that, and we move on. But at least I can say I asked on behalf of my folks. So. Yeah, I have to ask, ask the hard questions. I have to, you know, offer the, you know, the tough feedback and, and just try the best. I live in the community, so if, as an elected official, if I, if I haven't had the situation yet, but I, I know I'd be, I, I hope I'm held accountable to make sure I represent the voice of my community. But um, I think that, um, and I'm very, I'm very principled, and so I, I believe. Um, so I'm, I'm true to my, I try to be true to myself in the way that I make decisions 
as an elected official. Um, some of them aren't popular with some of our constituency groups on campus, like our unions, or faculty, or classified unions. But because I come from the, pers the, the perspective I come from is not the community, but particularly students, that's my guiding principle. And so that's, 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 that's the standard I hold myself to. So I talk to students, I, I, you know, I get involved with other community stuff uh, to make sure that I don't lose touch of why I'm there and who, who really put me there. So, um, but again, thankful. I still, I'm still green. There's a lot of ways still shiny in you. Politics <laughs> in that way hasn't um, completely, you know, you know, it's, it's still so fresh for me to make the decisions. But, you know, having worked for an elected official who represented, you know, who was one of five board members that represented so many people in the county and making decisions that affect, you know, 20, what was our the last budget, was like $24 billion, not million, billion dollars. I think that also helped, you know, has helped me in, in making some of the policy decisions. I think it's a, a little harder to describe in criminal defense because it's very individual. You have individual cases, you have individual clients that you need to listen to, and you have to make sure that you voice their opinion. So if there's a preference that they want to go to trial, if they don't want to go to trial, if they want to plead, if they don't, if they, you know, admit to some things but don't admit to other things, you really have to listen to them and you have to balance your knowledge of being an attorney and knowing what's right or knowing what you think is the risk that they should or shouldn't take with their um, preferences and opinions and also their concerns about what's going to happen to them because ultimately it's their life and no matter what we do or what we say, they're the ones that are going to have to live it. Um, so it's very individual, it's very client-based, but then there's kind of the larger constituency, if you want to call it, or community, um, and the policy work behind criminal defense, which oftentimes will work with organizations like the ACLU, um, for example, in immigration detention issues, knowing that people are getting kind of deported um, who have mental health concerns and they don't have representation during that time. So kind of having policy behind changing what's wrong with that or understanding like disparities with certain drugs like in the news now is like the, the disparity between crack and cocaine and the sentence being for different communities under those kind of laws and having, you know, having a larger base and wanting to attack those policies and then dealing with it on an individual case-by-case -case basis. So you just really have to listen to everyone's concerns, but then watch and see what's going on with the community at large to see how you can change things and how you can affect it. Um, but really your concern is the person who's in front of you at that time. And then once you see some more systematic problems happening, then you try to address those as a whole, but it's really just the client and what they want. Well, for me and the work I do, because I'm dealing with public officials, and their, one, of, one of their big jobs, I always think, is just to be able to serve their constituent group is, is giving them the tools to be able to do that. Um, moving into the digital age that we are, a lot of the things that we do now in my job is taking advantage of uh, new media and social networking to get them to uh, use those tools. I mean, a lot of them like to use it now, unfortunately. One of the struggles we have is, is coming up with policy on how to use a Facebook, how to use Twitter, how to use YouTube. Um, there, there are still a lot of questions because we, we have that fine line of uh, serving your community and serving your political interests. So we, we, we tend to have to make sure that uh, our members, and when I mean members, members of the Democratic Caucus or the Assembly, uh, that they that they focus on helping their constituents and listening to them and making sure that when they are voting on policy issues that they have their whole interest, their, their interest of their community in, involved in, in mind, not someone else's interest. And also to be able to get, at, to get the message out to their constituents that, hey, yes, I am doing work in your community. And that's always sometimes an issue because uh, well, unless it's on CNN or on uh, Keeping Up with the Kardashians, people don't tend to look at what's going on in front of them. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's one, one of the things to do. Other questions? Yeah, how do you guys utilize your connection with your professors after you graduated and entered the workforce? Like, how do you continue that? You mean other than bringing that to bring the <laughs> Sure. <laughs> For me, 
for me, the political science professors helped me all along the way. I mean, even to apply to schools and apply to jobs, you often need references and you often need letters of recommendation. So you really have to build those relationships while you're a student and keep those really, those relationships going after. Because, for example, for me, I didn't apply to law school two years after. And if I had I not kept in contact with them, come back during homecoming events, emailed them, kind of updated them on what I was doing, I would have been really disconnected with them and they wouldn't have known what to say in, in refer as a reference on behalf of myself or on letter of, letters of recommendation that they wrote for me. Um, so it's just really being in the clubs that they are kind of the, the leaders of um, and just always staying in contact with them and letting them know every time you have a new transition in your life, letting them know what's going on with you, especially if you live in the same area. I moved to San Francisco right after I graduated um, and I still kept those relationships with mostly political science professors and a couple of Spanish professors and it helped when I applied to fellowships, when I applied to law schools and even when I applied to jobs. So it's just starting now and then making sure you maintain them even after you graduate because if too much time goes by you either won't feel as comfortable approaching them or I don't think you'll have a problem with them not remembering you and that's the, the beauty of going to a small school versus Berkeley that had 40,000 students and here it's what 1,800 students and in your classes are less than 30. I mean it was amazing the one-on-one -on -one contact that you get with your professor so that they genuinely know you and I think that showed in my letters of recommendation and um, when they served as my reference they could really talk about me and it wasn't just a number you know a student who got an A in your class and this, they did really well and had good notes I mean they could really speak to um, your academic performance and I think that's unique to Whittier. I have to agree I am um I did uh, 50 hours a week of work study in my four years because I was on full financial aid. My parents were poor. They were like, if you want to go to college, great, we can't help you. So I was, uh, <laughs> I struggled, uh, honestly. Um, and not only did I get to know my professors really well, Dr. Price, is he still here? Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Price, uh, Dr. McBride? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, my yeah. gosh, <laughs> 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 Uh, Rob Carter, um, yeah. everybody know George McKernan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you guys are great. Um, <laughs> I got to know all of them, either I did work study for them, or I was one of their students, or something mixed up. I, I babysat Dr. Price's two kids. Oh. I babysat for Rock's, Rock's oh. oldest son, Jake. Yeah, I'm <laughs> <laughs> But like her, you know, I mean, initially when I first got out of college, I was looking to them, all four of them particularly, for for guidance, uh, mentoring, and also recommendations. And all four of them came through for me just like that without hesitation because I got to know them all so well. Um, but once I got into the Coast Guard, and I, I've, I've been successful in the Coast Guard, so I've, I haven't had to have a recommendation since, honestly. But um, I've kept in touch with every single one of them. I talked to George just yesterday. I talked to Rock a couple weekends ago. Uh, I heard Dr. Price was on the road over the summer singing at all the <laughs> 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 um, But so I've kept in touch with all of them, and it's, it's a friendship, you know. It's, they, they started me off in the right direction initially, and but ever since I've, I've managed to keep up with them, and just, just great people. And I and I think we've all said it, it's like you don't get that experience at a bigger school, so I can't be more thankful for that. So. I, well, except for running into the into like Dr. Les Howard, I always went, I, in fact, the other day, Last Friday, I was here with my brother and one of my brothers, and we saw him, of course. Les is always in the top. Um, <laughs> so, no, absolutely <laughs> critical. I actually took nine years off between going to graduate school, and I still had Les's number handy and <laughs> haven't mm -hmm. changed it. He still lives in the same place. He wrote my letters of recommendation um, and, you know, was supportive of me during my campaign. Uh, Fred Bergerson was another one. He actually opened, you know, really opened my eyes to public policy, and that got me excited about that. Um, and uh, he was at; they were both at my victory party last November. So they, um, you know, that's what you get. So definitely, you have no excuse whatsoever not to walk away with at least three professors that know you well, that will support you, that will make phone calls for you. Um, and so, and you know, guide you. Um, there's no reason. There's no excuse. The classes are way too. I, you know, I came from Columbia University, which is still a small liberal arts college. It's not as small as Whittier, um, but I was in classes that had 300 students. You know, some of them were. Most of our core classes were 12, 15 students. But you know, but here every class is small and intimate, and you know, there are no TAs because oh, well, they are, but they they're technically they are the TAs and the professors mm -hmm. and everything. So there's really no reason for you not to stay in contact with them or have a relationship with them that could continue on in your professional career.
I, I have nothing else to add, just that um, I've been a little bad about keeping in touch with them recently. <laughs> but w when I when I first got out of Whittier, I think they were more interested in what I was doing. They found what I was doing fascinating, mm -hmm. and just giving them all the gossip that's going on in Sacramento. <laughs> here, all my political yeah. science teachers love to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that there was ditto with what everyone else said. <laughs> I'll never forget when I uh, when we graduated in '93. You had at the what's it called? I forget the name of the stadium, the outdoor amphitheater. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I should know that, right? Um, <laughs> you know, you all you all line up and go up to get your diplomas, and uh, and all the professors are lined up along the sides to shake your hand and. Uh, I'll never forget, you get up to Dr. Price, and he's like, are you going to the Coast Guard? I said, yes, I am. And sure enough, here I've been dying to tell him that ever since I am hearing him today. I said, oh, it's a little strong. And, but I never forgot that. You know, he was, because he had, um, he did my recommendation for me, gave me some tips on interviews. So he he was part of that very initial process, and uh, I kind of want to tell him, look what you got today. Oh. Yeah, never forget that. So. And the best I should run, um, actually, his, I ended up working with his son, who, was, oh my god, when I met him, he was 10, and then he ended up graduating from Whittier and, and working for the supervisor, and he was my, he was my assistant, so I helped train him, so it's sort of like so, so many, so few degrees of separation when you're a Whittier alone. Great, thank you. Well, I think we should probably move on. Unless there's like a really pressing question or anything that you all want to bring up. Better be good! Better be good! Yeah. Like really quick, can I just hear about your interviewing skills and I'm thinking about the Peace Corps too, so like what is that like? Uh, Peace Corps if I recall, so a while now. Um, the thing about the Peace Corps was they wanted to find somebody with a well-rounded experience. So <clears throat> education alone was not enough. And I was involved in everything I could get my hands on in high school and at Whittier. So, you know, community <clears throat> service, um, uh, athletic activities, um, I was a failing, all those things. So they look at a well-rounded experience, not just one type of thing. Um, and for interviews, I mean, a, a couple of tips would be look at them straight in the face, um, speak slow, um, give good examples of your life experience. Don't just don't just give a party line full of big fluffy words. They want to hear about you, and they want to hear particularly about your dedication to Peace Corps, Coast Guard, whatever it may be. Um, and talk and know what you're talking about. So have have all the research done in advance about what the Peace Corps represents, things that they offer, the experiences you can get, so you can talk intelligently about the Peace Corps. And they'll know, okay, she's done research, so she's serious about getting into the Peace Corps. So do your do your um, do your homework, and again, just speak very freely, very precisely, and write me on it. <laughs>